Hi everyone, uh, I'm Francis McKay, joint PhD candidate in anthropology and the conceptual and historical studies of science. Like everyone else, I'd like to say thanks to the uh, social science division as well for supporting uh, the research and for putting on this conference so I can uh, present the research. So over two, year, two years ago, on April 2nd, 2012, the United Nations held a high level meeting on the topic of global happiness. Over the course of two days, politicians, diplomats, scientists, spiritual leaders and business professionals, over 800 in all, came together to discuss interventions for raising happi happiness levels across the globe and to do so using the latest scientific knowledge about well-being. Mm -hmm. And just in case it's not obvious from the expressions, this is actually one of the panel of happiness experts at the meeting. So the conference itself followed on the heels of a series of scientific interests in well-being, which had been in development since about the 1970s and which were grounded in research in what is called subjective well-being. And by subjective well-being, the researchers meant something like the feelings of happiness. And this was to, to be distinguished from objective well-being, which meant something like the general external conditions of happiness, the kind of things we ordinarily think are important to our well-being, but which we could lack and still feel happy. So the conference was about the subjective well-being. So this meeting was not the first time the science and politics of happiness has been suggested in the Western tradition. It's actually been a long-standing goal uh, in the West to have a science of happiness, uh, especially one that can be used to ground a secular politics of well-being. But over that time, we've never actually said we possess such a science. So what's different now is that we've got this belief that there is a science of the subjective feeling of happiness. Uh, as Frey says, we can... Well, I'm missing a slide there. So, as Frey says, we can measure human well-being directly. Oh, wait, maybe. Yes, that's the slide. So, um, that's not all that's um, what's being offered here, because we're also being given an international science and politics of well-being, one that's potentially suitable for every human being on the planet. So, we've heard um, talk in anthropology and science studies, for instance, on the topic of global health, and then more recently, global mental health. So what I'm saying we have here is the development of something similar yet different, what I'm calling global well-being. And I've been researching global well-being for the past few years for my dissertation. But over, the, over that time, I've tended to focus on a particular type of practice that turns up regularly in the literature on subjective well-being, namely a Buddhist-inspired meditation practice called mindfulness meditation. Now, some of you may be familiar with the practice of mindfulness. For those of you who've not, you can get a sense of it if you picture a meditator um, cross-legged, uh, focusing on his breath as he cultivates a sense of calm or peacefulness. And it turns out mindfulness has been quite popular over the past few years. And in this year in particular, it's exploded in popularity. So just in January, Time magazine um, said that America, there was a mindfulness revolution occurring in America, or at least amongst thin middle-class white women, judging by the cover image. Um, and it is true that also um, mindfulness has grown in popularity over the years, uh, largely as a consequence of the scientific studies that have been coming out about it, which associate mindfulness with a whole um, series of benefic beneficial effects, such as a therapeutic for things like uh, depression, anxiety, stress, and also as a form of enhancement for things like perception, attention, and emotional well-being. But it's, it's also true that mindfulness has a special place in the history of subjective well-being research. In fact, it's my contention that there's actually no other practice that has quite as much experimental verification in happiness studies or as much institutional presence. Um, so in addition to mindfulness now being something that people do in Buddhist meditation centers, 
It's also turning up in schools. It's turning up in business. It's turning up in healthcare. And it's turning up in cognitive science. And it also turned up the, at the UN conference that I mentioned at the beginning, where it was promoted as one of the determinants of the good life. And so for the past year, I've been conducting ethnographic research on mindfulness in the US uh, as a way of understanding these psycho-spiritual approaches to well-being. And I focused on what I think are three sites that are important for the introduction and dissemination of mindfulness to the US public. So that would be Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado, the Contemplative Studies Initiative at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, and the Center for Mindfulness in Worcester, Massachusetts. So I spent a, a year with people at these sites asking them what mindfulness was, what benefits it has, why it's become so popular over the past few years. And I even participated in the practice myself to get some kind of experiential understanding of it. And for those who want proof, is actually my grinning mug just after participating in a biofeedback study on meditation. So I'm still in the process of analyzing the data, but I want to give you a sense of where I think the research is heading. And in short, um, what I think the example of mindfulness reveals is a new figure of the human in political economy, what I'm calling homo eudaimonicus. And I'll say what I mean by that shortly, but I first need to give a bit of uh, background to, to set some context for that. So, arguably, the most famous attempt to theorize happiness and bring it into politics stems from the history of utility theory. And I know the history of utility theory is a long and complicated one, but over that history, it's generally thought about happiness in terms of uh, wealth. So, to, to illustrate that, if we take the, exam the example of uh, Jeremy Bentham, the founding father of utility theory. So Bentham said that the principle of utility, i.e. the greatest happiness for the greatest number, is the only right and justifiable end of government. But what he meant by utility or happiness here was actually pleasure. Um, so you can ask yourself, why is utility synonymous with pleasure for Bentham. Well, the idea actually comes um, from a uh, notion of happiness called desire satisfaction. So if we take happiness to be pleasure, then we usually experience pleasure, the argument goes, when we satisfy a desire. And we often satisfy desires by getting things that are useful to us, to those desires. So via a thing's utility. Uh, and the important point for Bentham is that you can measure that because we also usually get useful things by buying them. So money then can be a, re a, a measure of pleasure because it represents a subjective evaluation of your own e expected pleasure. And consequently, as a, uh, because of this history, when economists measure um, utility today, they're generally presupposing an image of the human as what's famously called homo economicus. That is a pleasure maximizing, self-interested and rational agent, one who actually gets, uses money to get what they want. So the majority of happiness scholars today um, reject utility theory and homo economicus as a way of thinking about well-being. In opposition to this, they tend to return to an ancient notion of happiness found in Aristotle's concept of eudaimonia. Um, the idea that virtue and wisdom are necessary for happiness. The paradox, however, is that despite referencing Aristotle's eudaimonia a lot, happiness scholars tend not to follow Aristotle's teachings. Rather, as a consequence of various social movements beginning around the 1960s, for instance, the countercultural revolution and the Tibetan diaspora in the US, it's actually Buddhist philosophy and practice that became the dominant paradigm for cultivating wisdom and eudaimonia in North America. And it was this paradigm 
that um, cognitive science and economics in part drew upon when they were researching subjective well-being in the late 20th century. But not only that, it's actually mindfulness that's become the dominant mode for institutionalizing that form of eudaimonia in public and private institutions, turning up regularly, as we saw earlier, in um, business, in education, in healthcare, and so on. My point is that in each of these environments, however, as it is being institutionalized, it's also being used to cultivate a certain kind of economic person. And I can give a test of that through the example of mindfulness at work. So it's generally recognized as in the social sciences that since the 1970s, we've entered an era of post-industrial labor. That's an era in which um, labor has become focused on the production of what Hart and Negri call immaterial goods. So such goods as knowledge, information, new ways of communicating, and so on. And as the products of labor have changed, so to have the forms of labor needed to produce those goods, with cognitive labor becoming much more highly valued in contemporary global capitalism. And Marx, for instance, had a, um, a, a term for those involved in industrial labor, right? the proletariat. So today we might ask whether what we're witnessing is a new age of the cognitariat. That is someone who sells their cognitive labor for the sake of the production of immaterial goods. In this new economy, however, it's actually attention that has become an economic value in particular. So that's to say when knowledge and information themselves become economic goods, and when much of our work requires us to interface with computers that require complex forms of attention to operate, then the cultivation of attentional skills in business itself becomes important. But attentional training is actually an essential part of mindful med mindfulness meditation, and it's actually considered a prerequisite for engaging in the cultivation of higher qualities like virtue, wisdom, and well-being. So this is the one, one of the main reasons I'd argue that mindfulness has found a foothold in industry. On the one hand, it allegedly facilitates the development of an attentional skills that are useful for the workplace. And on the other hand, it, um, it also counteracts the mental fatigue that comes with constantly working with digital technologies in, in, in business and in society more generally. So it's not surprising for that reason that one of the areas that picks up on mindfulness most explicitly is Silicon Valley. And what I think we have here is a simple notion of su supply and demand. So there's a business model on the one hand that requires intellectual laborers with resilient attentional skills, and on the other hand, uh, a psycho-spiritual practice that supposedly provides such skills. And mindfulness though it's not merely reserved for this kind of basic cognitive labor either. It's also increasingly used as a part of ethical leadership training and is seen then as a practice suitable for the creation of a new generation of CEOs. And it's significant on this point that Bill George has recently advocated mindfulness at Harvard Business School. So to conclude, and um, what I think these brief examples show is that mindfulness is a tool that can be used at the lowest forms of proletariat activity to the highest forms of management. Uh, so I think it suggests then the emergence of a new figure of the human in political economy, what I'm calling homo eudaimonicus, that is a being for whom virtue and wisdom are above that of wealth and pleasure but whose practitioners are increasingly seen as having more value than the instrumentalizing homo economicus by virtue of possessing a psychological skill set that's more able to adapt to the demands of contemporary global capitalism. Thank you. <laughs>